So my name is Matthew Tolbert and I'm from Ensign, which is an interpreting agency. I set up a business with three other people um, and it's providing interpreting for um, clients for access to work and uh, other things based in Norfolk. It's not only in Norfolk actually, it's uh, national. So uh, it's, that's not my only job, I've got other um, jobs as well. I also work for Norfolk County Council. Sometimes I work as a lecturer at um, uh, the UEA uh, for the social work team um, related to disability theory. So I came in uh, the last minute to give this uh, deaf awareness training. I've, I've had a lot of experience with deaf awareness training previously. Um, at different places, not only in Norfolk, but also nationally, um, in uh, employment, education, uh, social care, all sorts of environments. My interpreter today is Pippa, and uh, she'll interpret um, what I say in BSL into English for you. So I hope you're enjoying today generally with everything that's going on in the Deaf Festival. I've been planning this for a long time with a... Uh, Deaf Festival Committee. I was in the committee when it was first set up, I think it was about 2002, 2003, and then it stopped for a little while, and then uh, it got uh, set up with a disability festival. Uh, and BT here was involved in that as well. And then I realised uh, that in relation to disability, we were we were missing like something focused specifically on deaf people. So that's why I got involved in this. And I think it's really important. There are a lot of deaf and deafened people. Um, and people don't know where to access the relevant information. So there are different organisations um, working in isolation. And I thought it would be us, myself and the committee thought it would be good to get together in one place and uh, um, provide information, whether it be about social skills, the technology, um, other services available. It's just all available, all the information is available here. Just seeing the subtitles. <laughs> These are just the uh, aims of today. I'll, I'll keep it quite brief, as I said. So I want to look at um, identifying the main groups of deaf people and terminolo terminology used to describe them. Having a look at different communications deaf people might use. It's not an introduction to BSL, unfortunately, because it's quite brief, but we can look at the language. Also, um, creating awareness and understanding of deaf people and how you can better communicate with deaf people every day. Uh, communication strategies and tactics. And also, maybe, you know, you, you yourselves can take on board how to better communicate with deaf people and improve your confidence when you meet deaf people every day. Uh, usually we do a, a, do a role play as well, but obviously here we're we're quite short timed, so we've only got one hour, but even briefer than that now, so we'll have to drop that today. And generally, the last thing, we just want to promote positive deaf awareness, really. So, first of all, I just thought I'd ask you, throw it out to you, what you know about deafness. So, I've got the questions down here. So I'll ask you whether they're true or false. And if you put your hands up, uh, when you, whether you think they're true or false. So the first one, number one. Deaf people are normally expert lip readers. If you think that's true, raise your hand. It's false. Sometimes. All oh, right, that's interesting. I think it really varies, though. Yeah. 
Second one, hearing aids will help uh, hard of hearing people hear normally. That one's false as well. Number three, if you want to make a, a hard of hearing person hear you better, you should shout. Oh. Yeah, that's right, it's false. If a deaf person, if you're talking to them and they nod, it means that they're understanding you. Actually, that one's false too. Because what happens, so for example, you might be having a conversation, somebody's talking, and the deaf person, it's just like a natural way for the person to show that they're interested to nod their head. Or maybe the person's talking slowly and you're sort of nodding them to encourage to, them to talk faster, but the hearing person sees the nod and thinks that they've understand, understood. Either that or the deaf person doesn't understand and just thinks, I want to help things along, so I'll just nod my head to try and, you know, just get things going and uh, just let the communication um, and their, their explanation flow. Number five, British Sign Language is international. Do you think it's true? Yeah, number five, British Sign Language is international. You're right, it is false. Yeah, British Sign Language uh, is its own language. Other nations have their own language, uh, sign languages. So you might have a Polish one, a French one. It's only Britain, Australia and New Zealand that uses the two-handed sign language. Uh, most other places uses the one-handed. Uh, even in Northern, even in Ireland, Southern Ireland uses uh, one-handed. Uh, if you really exaggerate your lip patterns, it makes it clear, easier to lip read. Yeah, that's false. And I'll explain uh, that more later. Number seven is an interesting one. Deaf people have better eyesight than hearing people. It is false, yeah. But sometimes uh, it's not always clear. I think uh, deaf people quite often have better observational skills. They're better at seeing things sometimes. But actual, their eyesight is technically better. No, it's not. But I think it's related to how you learn. Hearing people uh, learn and can take things in auditorily, whereas hearing people use their, um, deaf people use their vision and take things in visually more. I'll just notice the pattern. Those are all false. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's good. <laughs> Yeah, they're all false. Well done. Yeah, so you know the answer to number eight already. Uh, most deafness is hereditary. It's not. It's, that's false. Right, terminology. So there are all kinds of um, terminology that's used, some that's seen as right and wrong, and different kinds of language to describe deafness. So I know it can be quite confusing. So usually there are these main four that are appropriate kinds of language. Um, it can vary a lot from these though. So first one is deaf, partially deaf, deafened, and hard of hearing. So if someone's deaf or profoundly deaf, it usually means um, they've, they've labeled that themse themselves that. And you can have big D deaf, 
That means um, you're a strong part of the deaf community, you identify yourself as part of the deaf community and deaf culture. It's a bit like an ethnic minority language, like for example Spanish or Italian, <laughs> if they're based in uh, England, they might see themselves as a, as a language minority, and the same with um, deaf sign language users. So that's big D deaf, like you'd say you were English with a big E, whereas little d deaf um, is more, it's more about the um, medical uh, hearing loss, if you like. So um, it could be if people are hard of hearing or um, they use uh, spoken English to communicate and the oral uh, communication to communicate rather than sign language. So, for example, I identify myself as big D deaf because I use sign language as my preferred um, language. Oh, the deaf um, poet that's here today, she identifies herself as small d deaf because she went to a mainstream school and she identifies certain barriers that she, uh, she experiences in the hearing world. Then she learnt sign language later on in life and then she became more included in the deaf community. So she's got it sort of like a balance between the two, little d deaf and big d deaf. So partially deaf, it was used in the class, uh, in the past, which was often called partially hearing. It's a way doctors uh, label a child, I suppose, are they're partially hearing. So they think, oh, they've got a bit of hearing there. It's the same terminology though, whether partially deaf or partially hearing, it just means... Yeah, medical, uh, medical professionals like doctors and things still say uh, partially deaf or partially hearing and also hearing impairment or hearing impaired. It's like, what exactly does that mean? Which one of those would it be? I, want, I like to focus on the social model of disability rather than the medical model of disability. Doctors look at uh, the medical side of people, that they're deaf and it's a sensory impairment, whereas I look at the social model which is, and the cultural model, which is more related to I'm part of this deaf community with its own language and its own culture. Deafened. Deafened means that the person's lost their hearing later in life. So they've grow, grown up hearing, they've been in the uh, hearing uh, culture and society. Um, it could be something uh, work-related through loud noises. They could have uh, been deafened through an illness. So in that, in that situation, you'd, you'd use the term deafened. And they usually, because they have grown up hearing, they wouldn't identify themselves as part of the deaf community or use sign language as their preferred language. Hard of hearing is a lot of people who uh, are classed as hard of hearing. Um, and it's very difficult to identify quite often because it uh, can be quite a hidden disability. Uh, a hard of hearing goes from a huge range of people. Um, usually, they, can, they could not identify themselves at all with the deaf community, or they could uh, you know, become part of the deaf community and identify with that. It really depends on the individual there. So with deafened and hard of hearing people, they can quite often struggle to uh, remain in mainstream community. So for example, they might go to a meal or a social event with a lot of people talking at the same time um, and not be able to access what's happening, so feel, feel excluded or isolated. Um, so they can, can quite often lead to depression uh, because of that isolation. 
or social isolation as well. If you've got any questions during, um, during any of this, feel free to raise your hand and ask. I was born partially deaf, so. So, meaning, how would you diagnose me? Deaf, 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 which. I'd say it's up to you, it's your identity. Like, for example, if you're from a deaf family, have a child who's partially deaf. It's natural for them to be involved with their deaf family and the deaf community, so for them to have a deaf, a deaf identity. But most deaf children are born into hearing families. If they have a partially deaf child, they want to, quite naturally, want to encourage them um, to be part of their world, the hearing world. And they wouldn't possibly think of, you, of encouraging you towards the deaf community because it's not their community. So I think it's... You decide yourself. I was born deaf. I went to a mainstream school where I had a partially uh, hearing unit. And when I was 16, I found Deaf Club, went there. So I identify myself with the deaf community, but it's based on individual, uh, an individual sense of identity. So do you identify yourself as Big D or Little D? When I meet with deaf people, I say I'm half deaf. When I meet with hearing people, I say I'm. No, sorry, got that wrong way around. When I meet deaf people, I say I'm half deaf, I'm half hearing. When I meet hearing, I say I'm half deaf, and I just miss out the hearing part. But when other like deaf people diagnose me, I don't know, so that's why I hear So when you say half deaf, do you mean in one ear I'm or? Fully deaf in this ear. So you could access this both worlds. <laughs> yeah. So you can choose to access either or both worlds, really. But what, what's interesting, with changes in society, the two different worlds, deaf and hearing, they should be sort of coming together into one world because we're looking towards inclusivity, obviously. So they shouldn't be completely separate. They should be included. But like you've seen uh, Daniel uh, Jennings talk about the deaf GCSE. He wants it integrated. He wants, he wants it integrated into schools. Not that it's a specialist subject and should be separate. He wants it all mainstream. Um, like you could say, uh, if your mother's black or your father's white, you could say, I'm, I'm mixed race, and you can maybe identify with both communities, both cultures, white and black, and you're able to access both. But it shouldn't be like black and white, it shouldn't be hearing and deaf, it should be, we are inclusive, it should be one world really, obviously. Because we're all people regardless, and we, we want access regardless. <coughs> Here's some facts and figures. The numbers vary depending on where you look. If you have a look on, try and research yourself. They're, they're all over the place. But action for, on uh, hearing loss have uh, one set of figures and statistics. The British Deaf Association have a different one. The government have different. Uh, NHS have different. Education have different. It's, it's a bit of a minefield. But which is right and wrong, we're not sure. But generally, this is roughly about right, about the right numbers involved. So we said a lot of the, uh, the people who can be classed to death are hard of hearing. My time back in... So previously, they said one in seven people would be um, deaf or hard of hearing. Now it's one in six. So, you know, I think it's growing, whether it's from things like music festivals and uh, loud music or people working in construction or with loud equipment. 
um, people using uh, um, uh, earbuds uh, for uh, listening to um, iPods and things like that, and on their right, listening to music on iPhones. I think all of that is having an effect on uh, people becoming deafened or hard of hearing. The number of deaf sign language users has, has varied. We've said, I've seen ones that say 70,000, 90,000, but it's very difficult to, to get a definitive proof. So when you fill in forms and things, um, could be a doctor's or a job interview or um, forms about ethnicities. So I can say I'm white sign language user um, and I'm British, but there should be something there to sort of say, in my opinion, to say a BSL user. I know they've got, have you got a disability quite often? And you tick yes. But when they're collecting data, they don't really concentrate on whether you use BSL or whether you identify yourself as part of the deaf community. For example, you yourself, you speak very well, but you've also got sign language and spoken language. So if, if, medical, uh, if a medical professional saw you, they'd concentrate on the, oh, well, you can speak well. So you're, you, they just put that down as, yeah, you speak, you speak English. But they, they disregard quite often the fact that you might be able to speak BSL as well. So they should be recording you as bilingual rather than, oh, you're an English user. Over 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents. That's a huge majority. So we've got services like the National Deaf Children's Society there to support these families. And you've seen Daniel Jennings talking about uh, his campaign. Um, other deaf people setting up blogs, campaigning um, for things like subtitling and to try to prevent missed opportunities, really. Um, parents, parents don't hearing parents quite often aren't aware of those barriers and then aren't aware of how to overcome them so it's important to get that message out there have you got any questions about these facts and figures no okay right now we're going to look briefly at communication methods so you can see those three main ones. Were you aware of these three before? OK, so the first one, BSL, British Sign Language, has its own uh, grammar, its own structure, uh, its own vocabulary. Sign-supported English and signed English are quite often used are more often used in education. For example, so you don't need a pen and paper. You can all do it in your own heads. So mentally draw a picture and draw this sentence. The man is on the bridge. So you think about it and think, well, what's the first thing I'm going to draw? Bridge. The bridge. People usually say the bridge. And then what? So you draw out the bridge first of all. And then put the man on top of it or walking over it. It doesn't say he's walking. <laughs> OK. So usually when people would draw a picture, some might draw it the other way, but you draw the bridge and then you draw the man standing on it. 
BSL is very similar because you think about a drawing and BSL is a very visual language. So first of all, you draw the bridge so that you had a basis on which to put the deaf, um, sorry, on which to put the man. Because if you did the man and then the bridge, the man would be floating in midair somewhere and that's great. Uh, yeah, the man would be floating in mid-air somewhere and the bridge could be somewhere else entirely. So it's much clearer if you draw the bridge first of all. Also, if you were to say the black cat. So for, if you're thinking again about drawing it, you draw the cat first of all, and then you'd shade it in black. And you'd sign the same as well, cat, black. So you can sort of see a little bit there about word orders. So in British Sign Language, you'd sign bridge, man, stands on. In sign-supported English, you'd use the same signs, but you'd use it in English word order. So you'd say man, stands on, bridge. And signed English, you have additional signs um, that you add in to show uh, English grammar and... Um, structure. So you they have signs that say the man is on the bridge. So you sign each word. <coughs> uh, the two bottom ones, SSE and SE, are most often used in education. So for example, to support a student, um, So whether you have a, a teaching assistant or a TA, they've usually got lower level qualification in sign language, so maybe like a level two. But really, it should be they have an interpreter with higher level um, BSL and English skills so that they learn um, bilingually. So it's like learning French and English and then say, oh, well, we'll, we'll, use, we'll uh, use French word order, but we'll use English words. It's just a confusion of the two rather than having two clear languages that you can fully use both. So another example. Attention, please. This is a staff and customer announcement. The customer lift is out of action for the next few minutes. Please speak to a member of staff if you need to use a lift. Thank you. So where was I before the interruption? Uh, oh yes. So for example, deaf people who use BSL as their first language, their English might be uh, not to a particularly high standard. For example, when I was English, when I was little, I was learning English myself. So we talk about cats for multiple cats. So I recognised it like the pattern. So one cat, two cats. So if there are multiple things, I add an S. Right, got that. So I was like, sheep, and add an S because there are two sheep. Then they were telling me, no, it's just sheep still. So I was thinking, okay, it's, that's this English rules. But they never explained to me why. It was just, yeah, you, this is the rule this time. You just have to follow it. So I, I was just thinking, well, why am I wrong for? It's like also evidence. I think, oh, if I've got multiple pieces of evidence, I've got evidences. And people tell me that that's wrong as well, but never explained. It's, oh, it's just the way with English, people would say. And I'd just be trying to accept it. But I it would be so difficult to get my, my head around it. Another <laughs> example, I still have a bit of a blockage with this. So with sign, with BSL, you sign about the past, present and future. And then in English, I see phrases like, I have had, 
I was like, what? Have is, have is present, had is past. Why am I using them both in the same sentence? It just throws me. So people would just go, oh, it's, it's English. It's, it's better that you take um, have off or had off or it just throws me. In English still sometimes I struggle with it because I don't think the rules have been explained to me adequately. So I, th I think that's why it's very important for young people at school to have BSL um, as a full language that they can learn English through rather than have a mixture and a compromise of the two. Still don't understand the rules, so don't you worry. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> you just follow the rules. It's simple. <laughs> like, for example, my f I've got a friend who's deaf and uh, German himself. So he now knows four different languages. I was just like, oh, wow, he's got some skills. And he said, English is the number one worst thing to try and learn. I was like, but you know German? He said, oh no, it's really easy to write and uh, understand German. And I just think, why is English so difficult? It's obviously a very popular language, but you're right. I think you, you're having the same experience as my friend coming here and experiencing learning English as a second language user. I think the closest language that can copy or match BSL is actually German in terms of like, um, you go time, objects, in the question, it's the same as German. Yeah. So Germans might be able to learn some language, but you don't. Yeah. Same as Arabic. The structure um, to that resembles BSL structure much more than English does. <coughs> Maybe I should move over yeah. there. <laughs> So, previously we talked about some of the myths about lip reading. These are some lip reading facts. So, 80% of lip reading is guesswork, but this does vary um, depending on uh, whether you can uh, use um, your residual hearing to back up what you're lip reading. 80%, that refers to if you've only got the person's face um, without the context. And then 20% 20, 20 you can read from their face, um, from their lips, and then the rest you're trying to guess from what you know from the context of what they're talking about, um, their facial expressions, uh, gestures and things like that. Also, lots of words in English look similar, like um, pair of things or a pair like the fruit, um, bear as in the animal or bear as in naked. A friend of mine told, a, told me a story and inside I thought, I wasn't sure about what they were saying. They said a vicar came towards them. And someone else came along and said, oh, you've got a lovely figure. And I wasn't sure, is it vicar or figure? And then I was thinking, they've got a lovely figure, but they've got this long black smock on. So, and then I realised they went vicar, oh, sorry, vicar rather than figure. Because the lip patterns are very similar, but obviously I was using context to try and um, judge what they were saying. Also, married and buried look very similar on the lips. But you hope that you can pick something up about the, from the emotions and facial expressions involved, which the person is talking about. Lip reading is particularly difficult at night. Oh, my number one 
hate is getting in a taxi, going home after an evening, and they're sitting there facing the other way in the dark, trying to talk to me. It's like, oh yes, yes, got no idea. It's very difficult. Also, lip, lip patterns obviously depend on the regional accent that the person's using. Like Scottish, if people have got a very strong accident, sorry, a very strong accent, it can be very different from just somebody in the, in the south of Scotland. So, for example, when I just met my wife, uh, her family are from the north. And her mum and uh, mum has a very strong Sheffield accent, and it took me a while to to get used to her accent and her lip pattern. And one day, we were sitting out down in the living room, and we were talking and watching TV and things. I thought, oh, I'll make a cup of tea for everyone. So I just checked, do you want tea? Everyone was like, yeah, lovely cup of tea, lovely. So. I went into the kitchen. My mother-in-law um, came in, gave me a pat on the shoulder. And she, she mouthed to me. I thought she said, would you like a piece of cake? I was like, oh, because I was thinking, right, I'm making tea, tea and cake. That makes sense, the English way. Sounds lovely. So I sat down, brought everyone's cup of tea out. We all sat down. And I was thinking, a little bit distracted and thinking, when's this cake coming then? I'm sure she said cake. Anyway, my father-in-law went out, came back in, and he gave me a DVD uh, of a comedian. <laughs> and he gave it to me and said, oh, do you want to check? And it's got subtitles on it. So I had a look and thought, oh yeah, it does. Turned it round to look who it was. And uh, the penny finally dropped. But, um, my wife's mum had said, do you want to watch Peter Kay, not do you want a piece of cake? So everyone was laughing that I'd made this mistake. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, I've got loads of, loads of examples of things happening like that. Quite embarrassing things, but I shan't, I'll keep the embarrassing ones to myself. A lot of people can get really worn out lip reading. It is exhausting. So, for example, you might go to a family meal at Christmas, loads of people around the table. You might have hard of hearing or deaf people there, and they're trying to follow different topics. One group is talking about films, another's talking about school, and, uh, and you just get lost in it. It's so difficult to follow. I'm always the first one to finish my Christmas dinner because I've just concentrated on the food rather than on the conversation. It is exhausting. So this is how you can identify, give you some ideas on how you can identify a deaf person. So. Deaf people quite often use facial expressions, body language, and pointing more than hearing do. I remember when I was little, my mum said, oh, pointing's rude. And I thought, but I'm deaf, I want to show you what I want. I need to be able to point. So um, if a person becomes deafened or hard of hearing, you might see changes in them. Um, they might show denial that they, they think they aren't going deaf, just that people are mumbling. Um, and they might feel depressed and frustrated and isolated. That one's quite interesting. Now we've got social media and uh, focus more on um, mental health. Uh, and recently they found, well, previously they said that 60% of deaf people might suffer with mental health. Re more recently that might have gone up, but I don't know more recent figures.
and it's, it can be quite scary and knowing what support's out there and where to go. Even if you speak to a counsellor, do they understand about um, deafness and hard of hearing um, and the experience, what it can be like to experience a hearing loss? Are they able to empathise with, with a deafened person? It's the same at social gatherings. Um, people might withdraw from them or choose not to not to go to them at all. Like with my wife, she might be saying, oh, I'm going out and I'll find out who it is. Like if they say, oh, it's parents from school and inside I'm thinking, oh, there'll be loads of people there and I hate it. Like just trying to go around and understand all these people. My wife just goes off and I feel sort of lost. <laughs> I prefer to like keep busy and do something like help washing up or something like that rather than just standing there by myself. Misunderstandings are very common. So you might ask somebody um, a question and they'll respond with something you think, that's not appropriate, that's not what I answered at all. So to, to clarify, when you ask people questions, it's best not to ask yes, no questions, that they can respond yes, no, because they're much harder to gauge whether they've understood. It's best to ask open questions and then the person has to give you a longer answer uh, in response. Also, you might shout somebody's name or call somebody's name and they don't respond. Like with me, people shout to me, they can see my cochlear implant obviously, but they shout and expect me to turn around. But I've, I can hear everything, the, I'm just getting everything at the same level and uh, might not hear <coughs> background noises. The person might, um, you might be able to identify visually or physically that the person's got um, uh, a hearing loss or that they're deaf through uh, hearing aids or cochlear implants. Oh yeah, they're very, they're very varied. People, yeah, it varies. It could be like a tiny invisible one or it could be one that goes behind your ear. Also Baja bone anchored hearing aids. Um, there are all sorts of different ones. One of the easiest ways is if the person's got a hearing dog for the deaf, they've become quite widespread now, very popular. Previously, people were like, oh, I don't want a dog, you know, dragging it around all the time. But now I'm getting a bit older, I'm thinking, that yeah, oh, could support me. Yeah, and they're down there in the, yeah, in the auditorium bit, yep. And also one of the most obvious ways to recognise a person's death, uh, they'll, they might be signing. Yeah. Like for example, downstairs you might pe see people who are um, signing and automatically assume they're deaf. However, they could be interpreters, they could be people who've learnt sign, um, <coughs> or if it's noisy, um, hearing people also sign to each other, um, or to have a private conversation. So just remember, not everyone who signs is deaf. Just keeping an eye on the time. So this is the last one. So they're just communication tips, really, for communicating with deaf people. So first of all, you need to get the deaf person's attention. So you can either give them a tap on the shoulder, do not crumple up paper or throw it at them, or give them a sharp push. If they're at a distance, some people stamp on the floor so, so that they can feel the vibrations. Another way to do it is to flash a light on and off. Or you can do what's called a chain tap as well. So say you're in a busy pub, 
you can tap someone, ask them to tap someone, who taps someone, who taps someone, who then taps the person that you want to talk to. Yeah. Try not to put things in your mouth when you're talking. Like I've tried to lip read people who've got chewing gum. Uh, and if you chew, it quite often looks like people are saying yes, 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 when they chew. Speak normally and slowly and clearly. Not super slow, but sort of a normal, relatively normal, slightly slower pace. If the person doesn't understand you, Rather than just repeating the same phrase again, try and rephrase your, your statement or question. So if you were saying, for example, it's a nice day, and the person sort of looks at you confused, you can point outside and say, it, it's a beautiful... Yeah. Okay, so you could say, Instead of saying it's a nice day again, you could say it's a beautiful day. Yeah, another way of doing it is if the person can't slow down or if you don't understand them, try to ask them to write it down. Just say, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Could you write it down, please? Yeah, it's, it's an attitude thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it's quite important to, um, when you apply with job, for jobs. Uh, also, when you're applying for jobs, you can see the Disability Confidence logo. And they've got information on that downstairs and information about access to work to allow um, uh, deaf and disabled people um, access and provide them with support when they're applying for jobs and working. So eye contact is very important. Don't be tempted to sort of look around and check out other things while you're talking to a deaf person. Stay looking at them. Try not to stand in front of a light like a window because it will throw your face into silhouette. And throughout the if you're, uh, say, doing a presentation for a long time, the sun might move around, so it might necessitate you having to move as well. It depends on the situation, really. So, for example, if someone's lying on a hospital bed and someone's talking with lots of people uh, going around in the background, that can be quite a visual distraction. So the deaf person might ask for the curtain to be drawn so they've got a blank background. Basically, one of the best things to think about is communication tips is try to em em empathise with the deaf person themselves and think, well, if I was there, what, would, what might be distracting for me or what would be better for me? And try to do that for the deaf person. And the last one, as I said before, is about using open-ended questions. So if you're not sure if a person's understanding you, use an open-ended question. So one that doesn't require a yes, no answer. It requires a more, um, a more extensive answer. And then you should be able to gauge from that answer whether the deaf person has understood you or not. So I think that's it. Do you have any more questions? Anyone? No? Quiet. I'm hoping you've learned something and can take something away from it. I mean, you might know quite a lot yourself, so... So are they, 
Are you applying through written applications? No, I'm you talking about when, when, when you have to go on, when you have to phone them or go online. When you get a video on the, on the, on the online application, when you get a video with the person speaking to you. But I don't know, I've got, I've always got jobs through um, either application forms I or I online. I my mentor with me, can't I? When I go for a job, I think that's probably helpful, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you think that would match your needs, then yeah, definitely. So, any more questions? Usually, employers ask now if you have additional needs, so you can have to disclose them at the beginning so they can help you. Yeah, there are lots of uh, equality related policies now. So, yeah, as Alien has said. So deaf or disabled people, um, if quite often if they meet the um, criteria, they will get an interview anyway. Anyway, thank you for coming, and I hope it's been useful. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs>